This is a production of Cornell University. All right, thank you, George. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll jump right into, George gave a nice introduction. Um, I'll jump right into talking about my dissertation work, um, studying cardiac glycosides in erythromum chiranthoides. So first I wanna start pretty broadly, um, talking about how plants um, avoid being eaten. And there are uh, a number of different strategies plants take. One of the main ones that people might think about are physical defenses, so things like spines and prickles. Um, maybe they have really tough leaves that make it difficult uh, for an insect to eat them. But plants are also really well known for their production of chemical defenses. Um, and this is an area that's been pretty well studied because plants produce just a massive diversity of different compounds that often have really interesting um, biological activity. So I'm showing two examples here um, of some compounds that plants produce that humans are a big fan of. So on the top, we have coffee here. Um, and this is, of course, caffeine. And then on the bottom, uh, this is tobacco and nicotine. Um, but in uh, the plant that I study, erysimum, uh, which is a member of the mustard family, brassicaceae, um, they produce a group of compounds called glucosinolates, which are some kind, sometimes known as the mustard oil bomb. Um, and these are what glucosinolates look like uh, when they're intact in the plant. They have variable side chain here, um, often derived from amino acid metabolism um, and sulfate group. And these compounds actually are pretty harmless um, as they exist in the plant. But then the plants also have an enzyme called a myrosinase, which cleaves the sugar and produces this unstable intermediate, um, which then degrades into these reactive um, products that you see here on the right that are potent um, anti-feedant and uh, anti-pathogenic compounds. Um, and these compounds are what give um, flavor to a lot of the plants in this family that we eat, including things like mustard and kale um, that give that bitterness. Uh, but these compounds have been around for a really long time. It's thought that they evolved about 90 million years ago. Um, in this lineage. And that's a lot of time for insects to adapt to these defenses. Um, so there are a number of insects that actually seek out uh, glucosinolate producing plants and they have a number of strategies for dealing with um, these toxic compounds. So one of them is the cabbage butterfly here, which is you commonly see flying around in the summer. Um, and they use a redirection strategy. So they have a special um, enzyme that redirects the unstable intermediate to kind of a less toxic uh, byproduct. Um, other insects like the diamondback moth here use um, enzymes to modify the glucosinolates before the sugar is cleaved. So they have a sulfatase that removes the sulfate group um, and uh, preventing the formation of the, the toxic compounds to start with. Um, and another strategy is sequestration. Uh, which is exemplified by the cabbage aphid here. Um, and they're sometimes known as the walking mustard oil bomb because they take the glucosinolates from the plant and they store them in their bodies to use them for their own defense. Huh. And so in response to this uh, herbivore pressure uh, from these, potentially from these specialist glucosinolate adapted insects, um, some members of the Brassicaceae have evolved new groups of toxic compounds that can be seen as kind of a second line of defense against these glucosinolate adapted insects. So a few examples of these are garlic mustard, which should be popping up soon around here all over the place, um, which makes these hydroxynitrile glucosides, uh, which kind of gives them the garlicky flavor. Uh, candy tuft is another example. They make these steroid derived compounds called cucurbitacins. Um, and finally, my study plant, the uh, wallflower or erysimum, which makes cardiac glycosides, also known as cardenolides, which I will just flip back and forth between calling them cardiac glycosides and cardenolides because it's hard to, to stick to one. Um, but they are steroid derived compounds. Um, so as you can tell, because they have this four, um, these four fused rings uh, from the steroid core, and then they also have this lactone ring up here at the top, and then they're often modified with um, sugars or hydroxyl groups or acyl groups um, that might kind of fine tune and change the activity. And 
Um, so as George mentioned earlier, they have very specific activity in animal cells. They're inhibitors of sodium potassium ATPases, which um, are critical for maintaining uh, membrane polarity in processes like heart function. Um, and for that reason, they're used in certain contexts to, to, to treat some heart conditions. But in addition to their um, medical importance, they're also of pretty substantial evolutionary and ecological interest. Um, they've evolved repeatedly in a bunch of different plant lineages. Some of the ones that people might have heard of are milkweed up here at the top um, with monarchs, which are adapted to cardiac glycosides, um, as well as foxglove down here, which is a plant you'll find commonly find in gardens. And this is the source of the, um, the pharmaceutical um, where it's purified from today. Um, but I am studying erysimum, which is up here in the Brassicaceae. Um, and uh, I, my main goals were to understand the biosynthesis of cardiac glycosides in this lineage. So the biosynthesis is not known in any of these lineages. And so what I'm hoping is, as we understand the biosynthetic pathway, it can give us some insight both into um, how these defensive compounds evolved in this lineage, but also potentially in other lineages. It seems like it's a relatively biochemically and evolutionarily accessible defense since it has um, convergently evolved so many times. And also what role uh, these defensive compounds play in a plant that is already pretty well defended given that it produces glucosinolates. And so Arismum chiranthoides uh, has a number of resources, some of which I developed, but actually a lot of them were developed before I started, I want to point out to B.S. Zeust, who's done a ton of work um, developing erysimum chiranthoides as a model, um, including helping with the, the original genome sequence. Um, and uh, also a lot of the, the resources that I've been able to use, including gene expression from the you know, 48 different species that George mentioned, um, and a transcriptome-based phylogeny that I used in some of my research. And then also Madi Mirzai, who was a um, former postdoc in the Jander lab, and she collected a lot of the gene expression data across erysimum chiranthoides tissues that I used um, and really enabled a lot of this research. Um, but erysimum in particular is a, is a good model um, for use in lab. It's small and diploid. It's relatively closely related to the model plant Arabidopsis, um, which so some of the, the resources available in Arabidopsis are pretty easily transferred to erysimum, and we can grow it easily in the, the growth chambers and greenhouses in the lab. Um, oh yeah, and I was able to develop floral dip stable transformation, which really facilitated characterization of some of the candidate genes um, that I will discuss later. And before I dive into that, I do want to go through a hypothetical pathway so that we know what kinds of enzymes we're looking for. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, they're derived from plant sterols. I'm showing here campesterol, which is an abundant sterol in plant membranes. Um, and the very first step um, has for a long time thought to be the cleavage of this carbon side chain um, to produce the first intermediate in cardiac glycoside biosynthesis, pregnenolone. Uh, and this enzyme has been known for a long time in animals. It's catalyzed um, by a cytochrome P450, uh, but when I started this research, it was not known in plants. Um, and the next couple steps involve the formation of this pregnane scaffold that the cardiac glycosides are built on. Um, and this involves a series of oxidation, reduction, and isomerization steps. Um, these types of reactions are mostly catalyzed by a group of enzymes called short chain dehydrogenase reductases. They're pretty well characterized in animals, less so in plants, um, although there is a substantial amount that is known. So there were some obvious candidates going in. Um, the oxidation of this hydroxyl group to a ketone is likely catalyzed by a three beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase. Um, the isomerization of this double bond from here to here, uh, likely catalyzed by a three keto steroid isomerase. In animals, these two reactions would be catalyzed by the same enzyme. It's not clear that that's happening in plants. Uh, more on that later. Uh, next, the stereospecific reduction of this double bond um, with an enzyme called a progesterone 5 beta reductase. 
um, such that this hydrogen is pointing out of the page, which is a little hard to see here. Um, and then the reduction of this ketone back to a hydroxyl group, potentially by the same enzyme that catalyzed this um, earlier reaction here. Next, we have a series of two hydroxylations um, at two specific positions, one at this 14 position here, and then another hydroxylation at this 21 position. Um, and no enzymes when I started were hypothesized to catalyze either of these reactions. Um, this 14 beta hydroxylation in particular is not a very common position for, for sterols to be hydroxylated. And so that one is of some interest. Um, finally, we need to form the lactone ring. Um, it's been hypothesized that this occurs through transfer of a malonyl group um, and then cyclization, which might be spontaneous or might involve the activity of some kind of cyclase. And then we have a bunch of enzymes that are modifying the end products through glycosylation, hydroxylation, acylation, that sort of thing. All right, so next I'm going to talk about some of the strategies we used to identify candidates um, for cardiac glycoside biosynthesis. And I want to point out again here two people who did a lot of this work, um, Marty, who's here today, and also Madia, um, who collected a lot of the data and, and um, did a lot of the work that my work was built off of. Um, so one of the approaches was a phylogenetic approach, was looking for enzymes or genes that were duplicated in Aristomum chiranthoides. It might have been new genetic material that the plant was able to use um, for this new pathway. Also looked at correlation between transcript abundance and metabolites across a bunch of different tissues and treatments. Um, did some gene co-expression, so looking for uh, genes that are all expressed together in the same tissues under the same conditions. Uh, with the idea that uh, if they're all involved in the same metabolic pathway, it's likely all happening um, in the same tissues or under the same conditions. And finally, um, mutant screens using chemical mutagenesis. Um, I again want to point out that I did not actually do any of the mutant screens. Ma uh, Maria did one round of screens, and then Marty did another round of screens um, that resulted in some really good candidates. And once we had these candidates, uh, we characterized them using a number of different approaches. One was uh, knocking them out using CRISPR-Cas9 and observing any potential cardenolide-related phenotype. Um, another one was transient expression in Nicotiana um, to hopefully reassemble the pathway, um, either partially or in full, um, and also in vitro assays with purified recombinant enzymes. Um, and so the gene co-expression networking was one approach that um, was very fruitful in identifying candidates. Uh, so we first tried doing this across tissues of Aristomum chiranthoides. And um, kind of surprisingly, we actually didn't find anything with that. There were no modules of co-expressed genes that seemed like they might be involved in the formation of a steroid-like molecule. Um, and so I turned to another source of variation um, that was available to me, which was the, the 48 different species of erysimum that uh, Tobias had worked with that I mentioned earlier, that we had collected RNA-seq data for, for the purpose of building the phylogeny, but we also had it, that I, and I was able to use that to build a co-expression network of genes across the entire genus, or at least the, the species that were included here. Um, and that did yield some pretty good results. There was this module of co-expressed genes, um, nine of which were involved in the core steroid biosynthesis pathway, um, shown in blue. And then there were a number of other genes that were good candidates for involvement in cardiac glycoside biosynthesis, um, some of which were annotated as being potentially steroid related, but they hadn't been characterized yet. Um, that included a glycosyl transferase, two cytochrome P450s, um, and then two hydroxysteroid dehydrogenases. Um, and then there were another of there were a number of other metabolic enzymes that potentially had roles in some of the other steps that I talked about. So one of those cytochrome P450s was CYP87A126. Um, and when I expressed it in Nicotiana, um, I observed the formation of this compound here called pregnenolone, which is um, the product of the sterile side chain cleavage that I discussed earlier. 
Um, so it seems like this enzyme is catalyzing this reaction. A few other groups actually simultaneously found the enzyme from other species, um, and they did some more in-depth characterization showing that those enzymes are capable of using a number of different sterile substrates, including campesterol and cholesterol, um, to produce pregnenolone. And so I knocked this out. Um, actually, Marty made this knockout. Um, it was one of the first ones we made in erysimum and um, in the two independent knockout lines. This is the total cardenolide related peak area. Saw a pretty much complete knockout of um, cardiac glycoside accumulation. And because we were pertur perturbing um, this one important defense, we wanted to look at the glucosinolates as well. Um, so we checked those and the glucosinolates were completely unchanged. So it didn't seem like there was substantial uh, crosstalk or feedback going on there. Um, and so this is exciting because we learned more about the biosynthesis, but this also gives us a really useful tool for understanding what role uh, these compounds are playing in an ecological context. And so the first thing I did uh, was with the help of Anurag and Amy, um, I did a sodium potassium ATBase inhibition assay. So as I mentioned earlier, um, cardiac glycosides um, specifically target sodium potassium ATPases and inhibit them in animal cells. So they've developed a, um, an in vitro assay that allows us to test plant extracts for how much they inhibit sodium potassium pumps. And so what I'm showing here on the left are the um, inhibition curves from that with wild type um, erysimum in black here. Um, and so farther left is more inhibitory activity. And then as a cardenolide free control, um, we used Arabidopsis. So in theory, we shouldn't see any, any inhibition with that, although at high concentrations of plant extract, the, um, we do see some apparent inhibition, but not exactly sure what's going on with that. But what was clear was that the two knockout lines, in one case, it was maybe, there was maybe some residual inhibitory activity, but for the most part, it was on par with cardenolide-free um, Arabidopsis, which is exciting. Um, and so from there, I moved on to testing the response of some insect herbivores um, to the knockout lines compared with uh, wild type. And so for these experiments in the lab, I used four different insects. Two of them were broad generalists, meaning that they happily feed on a bunch of different plant species. Um, and they're likely not specifically adapted to glucosinolates, like I mentioned earlier. And so these two uh, insects were the cabbage looper and the green peach aphid. And then I also used two of the specialist herbivores that I talked about earlier that specifically seek out um, plants in the brassicaceae to feed on. And this is the cabbage butterfly and the cabbage aphid. And so for each of these insects, I did two assays. Uh, one of them was a choice assay where I put them either in a petri dish with a wild type leaf and a mutant leaf, and I let them make a choice about which they preferred to feed on over the course of, you know, one or two days, um, and then recorded their choice at the end. Uh, the exception to this was for the cabbage butterfly, where I um, did an oviposition choice assay. I put a gravid female in a cage with one wild type, one mutant plant, um, and allowed her to lay eggs on uh, the plants and then counted where she laid the eggs at the end. And then the other kind of assay I did was a growth assay where I bagged um, insects on to, to plants. So they were either restricted only to wild type or only to the cardenolide free mutant plants and observed their growth over a period of a week or two. Uh, and what I found was that in the generalist insects um, in some cases showed a slight preference for the mutant lines, but in general, they were able to perform at least okay on both lines. So for, for the green peach aphid, um, there was maybe a slight trend that they preferred the mutant lines, um, but overall wasn't significant. And then for colony growth, where I just put five aphids on the plants and counted how many there were after two weeks, um, there was absolutely no difference between the two lines. Um, Things were a little more clear for the cabbage looper. Um, so there was a very clear preference for the cardenolide free mutant plants if they were given a choice. Um, but if they were restricted to a plant, um, there was maybe a slight growth advantage if they didn't have the cardiac glycosides, um, but they were generally able to perform okay 
um, even in the presence of cardiac glycosides. Oh, this text does not look very good there. Um, but uh, with the two specialists, they appeared to be far more impacted by cardiac glycosides. And so for the cabbage aphid, um, there was again a clear preference for the two mutant lines. And um, for colony growth, there was a very drastic difference. The aphids I put on wild type plants were not able to reproduce at all. Most of them died. In a few cases, there was one or two aphids still alive at the end of the week. Um, but they were able to happily establish colonies on the, the cardinalite free mutant lines. Um, saw something similar for the cabbage butterfly, um, where they almost never laid eggs on the cardinalite producing wild type plants. Um, and they completely refused to feed, even if that was their only option. Um, on the cardenolide producing plants, but they happily began feeding on the um, knockout lines. I will note, I used uh, refused to feed or began feeding because most of them did still die on the mutants, uh, but a few of them reached pupation and made it to adulthood. Um, so they were able to complete their life cycle on, on the mutant plants, which was exciting. Um, and so I wanted to take this one step further and I planted them out in the field this past summer. I'm not going to go too much into the design, but I had wild type plants and um, the knockout plants in the field. I visited a couple times and just recorded what I observed on each plant. Um, and so at the end of the experiment, these are the most common visitors with the number of observations at the bottom, by far the most common insect that I saw was this striped flea beetle, um, which is a crucifer specialist, and it did not seem to care, at least in terms of how often it occurred on any individual plant. It didn't seem to care about cardiac glycosides at all. Um, and then the turnip aphid, which is another crucifer specialist. Uh, I saw a lot of them, but that's really because there were a few colonies that were really quite well established, so I can't really draw any conclusions from that. Um, I also saw a good number of snails as well as a lot of spiders um, that were not eating the plants, but they were building their webs and living uh, in the plants. I also want to give an honorable mention to the woodchuck that managed to just completely chop down 22 of the plants. Uh, and they also did not care about cardiac glycosides, probably because they weren't actually even eating it. They were just, I, don't, I honestly don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> so, but for two of them, I did get two exciting results. The cabbage butterfly, like we saw in lab, really doesn't like laying eggs on cardenolide producing plants because it knows, well, I don't know if it knows, but it, the, the larva won't feed on it. So it's a good idea not to lay eggs on them. Um, and then the snails also, which I was not expecting, were more commonly observed on the knockout plants. I didn't do anything like measuring leaf area eaten by snails or anything, but the fact that they were um, almost twice as likely to be found on the cardinalide knockouts suggests that they're doing most of their feeding um, on the knockout plants. All right, so that was all I had on the insect side. And so now back to the chemistry and searching for enzymes that are involved in this pathway. Um, so I talked before about this scaffold formation step that involves a series of different enzymes that catalyze redox reactions on the steroid core um, and this isomerization. And there were two good candidates in the co-expression cluster uh, to catalyze these kinds of reactions, the two hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, uh, genes. And then um, there were also some EMS mutants that showed promise here. One that Marty found, one that Madia found. Um, and so with those three enzymes, uh, which are marked here about whether they were found from an EMS mutant, uh, that's the chemical uh, mutagenesis, or the co-expression cluster. In one case, the three beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase was found using both um, approaches, um, but I used in vitro assays with purified recombinant enzymes to confirm that they at least possess the activity shown here in um, in vitro. 
And so, especially with this three beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, it's kind of unsurprising that it's able to catalyze this reaction, the, the oxidation of this hydroxyl group to a ketone. Um, and in vitro, I did see some apparent isomerization along with the oxidation. Um, but at this point, I'm, it's not clear to me whether that's happening spontaneously um, or whether that's actually activity that is catalyzed by the enzyme. So if I feed this isoprogesterone here to the 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, I see really very little isomerization. But with this other enzyme, three, which I am calling a 3-ketosteroid isomerase, um, we see very good isomerization of the isoprogesterone to the progesterone. So it seems like these two enzymes are working together to produce progesterone, which is in contrast to animals where there's usually a single enzyme that catalyzes both of these steps. Um, I think in bacteria, it's also two separate enzymes. Kind of interesting there. Um, there was one report actually of a 3-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase from plants that is able to catalyze both of these reactions, but I'm still not quite convinced. It seems like with um, some potential spontaneous isomerization there that uh, careful attention needs to be paid to that to, to really definitively talk about the enzymatic activity. And then this progesterone 5-beta reductase catalyzes the 5-beta reduction of progesterone, um, unsurprisingly. And then the 3-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which is the same enzyme as over here, at least in vitro is able to catalyze the reverse reaction, um, the reduction of this ketone back to the hydroxyl group. Um, whether or not that's happening in planta, I'm not sure at this point. Um, there was actually another enzyme in the co-expression cluster that caught my eye. And this was a steroid 5-alpha reductase, which catalyzes the same reaction as the 5-beta reductase, but with inverted stereochemistry. So you can see the product of this, the hydrogen, here is pointing out of the page, and here it's pointing into the page. Um, and this enzyme is called deedylated 2 um, or DAT2. Uh, it's fairly well characterized from Arabidopsis because it is involved in brassinosteroid biosynthesis. Um, and so mutants to this enzyme are deficient in brassinosteroids, and they are dwarfs. Um, and it seems like this enzyme, in addition to catalyzing the analogous reaction in brassinosteroid biosynthesis, is capable of using progesterone as a substrate um, to potentially produce these 5-alpha intermediates, which might lead to the production of um, cardiac glycosides with altered stereochemistry at this position. And that might not seem like a big deal, but um, if we draw the compounds in kind of a different way, to give you more of an idea about the 3D structure of the molecules, um, it does actually make a substantial difference in terms of the overall shape of the, the cardiac glycosides. So in the 5-alpha configuration here, the um, fused rings are relatively flat with each other, um, whereas with the 5-beta cardenolides, um, there's this kind of kink that's introduced um, at the final ring. So with the knockout mutants, we can start to see um, that these, uh, the presence or absence of some of these enzymes might be controlling the overall configuration of the cardiac glycosides that the plants produce. So in wild type plants, when all of the enzymes that I discussed are present, uh, we see production of these five beta cardenolides here, which is represented here um, with each cardenolide color coded with um, as in terms of the overall peak area on the mass spec. So wild type, we pretty much only see five beta cardenolides. Oh, and I have the little configuration down there to show you that it is different. Um, but the pathway mutants, we see the accumulation of atypical cardenolides that we don't usually see in wild type plants. So if we knock out the three beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase um, we get these cardiac glycosides that are still reduced at the same position as this pregnenolone intermediate. So it seems like the pathway enzymes are using this intermediate that accumulates in this mutant line to produce cardiac glycosides with altered um, reduction at the steroid core. We see something pretty similar if we knock out the keto steroid isomerase, um, where we see accumulation of these delta-5 cardenolides. Um, if we knock out the progesterone 5-beta reductase, uh, 
we see a complete loss of the five beta cardenolides um, and the accumulation of five alpha cardenolides with inverted stereochemistry at that position. And then if we knock out the five alpha reductase at two, we get these tiny little mutant plants. Um, they're, yeah, you can barely even see them here. These plants are the same age. Um, and the cardinalide profile is relatively unchanged, um, which is perhaps unsurprising because we don't usually see 5-alpha cardinalides um, in erysimum carbonthoides. But if we knock out both DAT2 and progesterone 5-beta reductase, we completely lose or almost completely lose cardiac glycosides that are fully reduced in their steroid core um, and instead end up with the um, a mix of delta-4 and delta-5 cardenolides with the double bond at different positions there. Um, and so uh, with these mutants, it became obvious that it was relatively easy to change uh, the end products of the pathway just through the activity of a single enzyme in the middle of the pathway. Um, and we looked at some of the variation in the sequence and expression of these enzymes across the genus. Um, and saw some amount of correlation, especially with this progesterone 5-beta reductase. Um, in terms of when it's expressed, we get 5-beta cardenolides. When it's not expressed, we do see the accumulation of some 5-alpha cardenolides in certain species. Um, I don't have time to go in depth about that now, but we did just upload a preprint to BioArchive if you are interested in learning more about that. All right. For the last part of my talk, um, I want to discuss the two hydroxylases that are acting on cardenolide intermediates. Uh, so if we go back to the co-expression cluster one last time, uh, there are some two oxyglutarate dioxygenases that were co-expressed with the other cardiac glycoside biosynthesis enzymes. Um, two oxyglutarate dioxygenases are a pretty abundant um, type of gene in plants. And they uh, mostly catalyze uh, the addition of hydroxyl group or otherwise oxidize um, small molecules and are often involved in specialized metabolic pathways. Uh, one of them is this AOP1 like uh, enzyme. So AOP1, AOP means alkenyl hydroxyalkyl producing, it's known from Arabidopsis. And it, the, so AOP2, AOP1, the function actually isn't known, but AOP2 and AOP3, which are closely related, um, are involved in glucosinolate biosynthesis. So it's kind of interesting that there would be this close relative of these glucosinolate genes um, co-expressed with the um, cardiac glycoside biosynthesis genes. And then not in this iteration of the co-expression cluster, but in a slightly modified one with different parameters. I also saw another 2-oxyglutarate dioxygenase um, which is a duplicate of uh, dioxygenase for auxin oxidation one. And this is an enzyme that is involved in um, auxin homeostasis. It oxidatively deactivates auxin. Um, and there are two copies in Arabidopsis, but one of them has been duplicated an additional time in erysimum. And that one is co-expressed with uh, cardiac like side biosynthesis genes. Uh, so I knocked both of them out, and they both are deficient in cardiac glycoside biosynthesis, which is exciting, um, suggesting that maybe they're catalyzing these two successive hydroxylations. Um, the AOP1-like was pretty much undetectable levels of cardiac glycosides. Dow1-like, uh, I could detect cardiac glycosides, but there was about a hundredfold reduction in total abundance of the compounds. So it's exciting to have these mutants, but what I really want to know is what these enzymes are actually doing. So for one thing, what order they're acting in, and for another, the position of hydroxylation catalyzed by each of these enzymes. Um, and so the mutants do give a little bit of a clue to that. In the AOP1-like knockouts, some of these earlier intermediates in um, cardenolide biosynthesis accumulate to higher levels than we see in wild type, suggesting that maybe this one is acting directly on those intermediates and might be the first hydroxylase. And then in the DAO1-like knockouts, um, we see really high levels of accumulation of an apparently, I guess, dihydroxylated intermediate, suggesting that it might be the um, second enzyme to act in the pathway. 
And these intermediates are also glycosylated, which is why we see several different peaks corresponding um, to uh, this mass. Um, another clue that the um, that these mutants can give me is through feeding of substrates to the mutants to see if we can restore cardiac glycoside biosynthesis. Um, and so most of these intermediates are not commercially available or I wasn't able to find them. But one somewhat similar compound, this 21 hydroxy progesterone was available. Um, so the only difference between progesterone here and the 21 hydroxy progesterone is this hydroxyl group here, um, which is required in cardiac glycoside biosynthesis. So shown here at the bottom, um, is the wild type um, chromatogram of um, a mass that is commonly associated with a bunch of different cardiac glycosides. And so I'm kind of using these peaks just to show, you know, we are seeing the cardenolide peaks or we're not. And so in wild type, we see a bunch of different peaks. Um, and in the AOP1 like knockouts, um, whether I feed it progesterone or 21 hydro hydroxy progesterone, this was uh, infiltration with a syringe into the leaves um, after 24 hours, we still don't see any cardiac glycosides. But in the Dow1-like mutants, uh, if I feed progesterone, I don't see much of anything. But with 21-hydroxyprogesterone, we do see those cardiac glycoside peaks reappear. Um, so this is pretty decent evidence that the Dow1-like enzyme is required for 21-hydroxylation. Um, I also took these enzymes and while well, I expressed them in Nicotiana and co-infiltrated some substrates to see if they were active um, on the cardenolide intermediates. And the AOP1-like enzyme I found readily hydroxylates pretty, oh, pretty much any cardenolide intermediate I'll throw at it. It doesn't really seem to care what's going on down at this part of the molecule. Um, and I am showing the hydroxyl group at the 14 position, although I don't have super great evidence that that's what's happening. Um, in addition to the other enzyme maybe catalyzing the 21 hydroxylation, so by process of elimination, this one would be the 14 hydroxylase. Uh, this compound right here uh, has been reported in some plants just to accumulate to high levels. So in this paniculate swallowwort, which is used in Chinese medicine, um, this compound accumulates. And when I feed AOP1-like with pregnenolone here, I see a peak with this mass that is also present in paniculate swallowwort. Um, so that's maybe some more evidence that it's the 14 hydroxylase, um, although it would require additional uh, confirmation uh, to be really sure about it. And then uh, if I co express both AOP1 and DAO1 like um, and feed it some of these intermediates, I do see that DAO1 like seems to consume whatever's made by AOP1-like uh, and produces new intermediates that don't have quite the mass that I would expect. For one thing, they seem to be glycosylated. This is likely happening uh, by um, endogenous enzymes in Nicotiana, uh, which is one of the problems with trying to rebuild the system in Nicotiana is that we have some potentially promiscuous activity in Nicotiana um, benthamiana enzymes. Um, but that's not really what I'm worried about. What I'm more worried about is that the mass of these compounds actually correlates with the addition of this um, potentially an aldehyde right there. So we're missing two hydrogens compared to what I would have expected if it was a hydroxylation. Um, and so maybe these intermediates are involved. Maybe this is something else weird that's going on in the Kosciana. Um, I don't know. I also don't even know that these structures are correct, um, but it's definitely active. Um, which is exciting. Uh, all right, so I do now want to talk more about, I think both of these enzymes are kind of interesting evolutionary stories in terms of looking at gene duplication and how plants evolve new uh, metabolic pathways. And so as I mentioned earlier, DAO1, um, there is duplicated an erysimum relative to other related plants. So here we have the rice, um, Dow as the out group. And then these are all a bunch of other brassicas. So that's Camelina, Utrema, Brassica. Um, in general, in Brassicaceae, there are two main clades, Dow1 and Dow2. And then in Erysimum, there's 
seemingly an erysmum specific duplication here with uh, presumably this 1G20320 um, maintaining the ancestral function of DAO1 in oxygen, oxygen homeostasis um, and this 1G20322, which is the DAO1-like enzyme that potentially has taken on a new role. Um, and so if we look at microcentony between the, the um, loci containing um, these enzymes in Arabidopsis here on the top in erysimum. So in Arabidopsis, DAO1 and DAO2 are a tandem duplication. And then in erysimum, um, there's just an additional tandem duplicate of uh, DAO1 that has seemingly taken on a new role in cardenolide biosynthesis. I'm not showing it here, but um, we're working with a collaborator, Cynthia Holland at Williams College, who just right before my seminar sent me some exciting uh, modeling results uh, that are helping us understand which um, changes to, to amino acid residues in the active site um, might have contributed to this pretty substantial shift in substrate preference from this small ox oxygen molecule here um, to the larger uh, pregnant intermediates in cardiac glycoside biosynthesis. So AOP1 um, is a little bit more complicated in that in Arabidopsis, uh, we have AOP2 and AOP3, which are involved in glucosinolate biosynthesis, and then AOP1 here, which does not have a known function. Relative to the one copy of AOP1 in Arabidopsis, there are five in erysimum um, that are scattered across a few different loci on chromosomes three and two. Um, and it is this one over here, 3G34150, that seems to have taken on a new role in cardiac glycoside biosynthesis. I also think some of these other enzymes, um, I didn't mention, but some of them are also co-expressed in the, in the co-expression cluster I showed earlier. So it seems like some of them might also be involved um, potentially in modification of cardiac glycosides, and I think they're good candidates for further study. Um, and so that also leaves open the question of what about the rest of the pathway? Um, and the answer is, I don't know. I cloned a ton of genes and um, didn't see really any activity in Nicotiana for a lot of them. Although part of this might be the fact that we're seeing um, modification of the intermediates in Nicotiana by endogenous enzymes that might be interfering with the activity of some of the later enzymes. Um, there is a acyl transfer, a malonyl transferase that seems like a really good candidate in the co-expression cluster, but I haven't seen any activity um, when I've tried to clone it. So I don't know what's going on there. There are also some good candidates for glycosylation and hydroxylation that I won't discuss further. Um, so that's all the science I have, but I do want to thank, uh, acknowledge all my friends uh, <laughs> who uh, really made grad school great, and my girlfriend, who also made grad school great, uh, and uh, also my family, Oop, there they are, who, many of whom came to see me today. Um, and then also, of course, all the people who were involved in my uh, PhD, who, uh, you know, taught me different techniques, advised me in various ways, collaborated on various projects. Um, these five people up here uh, are, well, Maria, I talked about a lot earlier as, as well as Marty, um, but Toby, Ana Maria, and Julia are undergrads who worked on erysimum with me as well and did some really great and exciting work um, and contributed in really important ways. Um, also, of course, want to acknowledge my funding sources and my committee uh, who are always ready with good advice um, and guidance. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, uh, so it looks like a lot of your insects weren't feeding on the plants with cardenolides on them. They were choosing not to. Do you have any ideas about the mechanisms that might underlie that? Like, how are they doing? Are yeah. They um, so the, the cabbage butterfly in particular are interesting because they just, as far as I can tell, when I watched them, they would land on it and then just fly away. And they wouldn't, it, I mean, I don't know, maybe they're scraping their ovipositor on it or something. Um, but it seems like, yeah, there, there has to be some kind of a, recognition mechanism, even without feeding for them. So on their tarsi, they, they probably have some sort of receptor. And then they are bitter, I believe. I have not tried them. Um, but in terms of, I, I think they, they'll feed on it and then it, it just tastes bad, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, fire. Yeah. 
treat, but uh, the involvement of DT2 in, in cardiac uh, behind-the-side virus conditions. I'm just wondering if you know or hypothesize anything about any potential crosstalk between drastic steroids and, and cardiac virus. Uh, cardiac black side virus. Like, do you think, like, if you apply a graph to do you think you'd see an induction of, of cardiac black side production? Or, 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 yeah. Or, I think that's an interesting question. In particular, I mean, they're using the same precursors <laughs> as well. So you can imagine, especially in the, the knockout lines where we're, I knocked out cardiac like side biosynthesis, which was like a huge sink for, for sterols. And so maybe the accumulation of those might have led to differences in brass and steroid biosynthesis. I didn't see anything with that. And I do know at Cynthia, who I mentioned earlier, did some experiments um, with growing erysimum on plates with brass and steroids. And I don't think she saw anything. Um, one interesting thing, what? Oh, there were more of them with the brass and steroids. Oh, okay, cool. There you go. Did you do some of those experiments too? Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, apparently I don't know, but uh, I was gonna say something else. Oh yeah, another interesting thing. So in erysimum chironthoides, there's only the one copy of DET2, which, it seemed maybe a little surprising that it could be active in cardiac like side biosynthesis, but then it's also involved in, in brass and steroid biosynthesis. Um, there are other species of erysimum that do produce the five alpha cardenolides. And I don't know in some of those species whether they might have a dedicated copy of DET2 that could be you know, regulated or have different activity um, compared to the DET2 that's involved in brass and steroid biosynthesis. But yeah, it's a good. Good question. Yeah. I guess I was wondering, so um, in the plants that make the 5-alpha cardinalides or the like delta-4 or delta-5 cardinalides, do you, do you think that those have like different effects on sodium potassium ATPase? Or like, I guess when we were looking at Madia's mutant, it like, it was more toxic to the insects despite having lower abundance of cardinalides. Like, do you think that like, like, what do you think this is doing to the insects if they have, I guess these are mutants, but what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think that it is, there's definitely potential there for differences. I mean, I, I, it's definitely known yeah. that, I think the five beta cardenolides are generally thought to be more toxic. Uh, although I've maybe seen some conflicting things with that and I don't want to speculate too much without knowing uh, for sure. One thing about, so what Marty alluded to was with the progesterone five beta reductase mutant, that Madia made, it was a, one of the chemically mutagenized line. She tested uh, insect growth and she generally saw better growth on the mutants. No, they grew worse on the mutants. Anyway, there was a conflict between what she saw in the mutant line or when she was doing insect feeding and when she was doing the, the sodium potassium inhibition assay. Um, and so there's also potential there for different for different herbivores, like some herbivores, the 5-alpha cardinalides might be more effective against, some the 5-beta might be more effective against. Um, and then another thing with that mutant was the hydroxylation was completely gone. Um, and so the, that can affect the polarity of the cardinalides, which could also affect things like uptake and activity, which might explain why we're seeing a difference between the feeding and the in vitro assay. Yeah. Um, you said for the progesterone, there's two enzymes working, and that was also seen in bacteria. So could it... yeah, for yeah, yes. Could that be like a horizontal transfer? Did you look at the sequences, or do you think it's just converging? I don't think it's horizontal transfer. No, um, I did look at the sequences. Um, I mean, there are there are homologous enzymes in animals of the what, as far as I can tell, only has the keto steroid isomerase activity, um, and I couldn't find. I couldn't find a lot of information about what those enzymes are doing in animals. So I think there's a lot to be done. I think what I did um, still leaves a lot of questions open, um, but I don't think it was horizontal gene transfer, no. So I think we're out of time. Let's thank George one more time. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.